I'm Pat Fitz, director of the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. And I'm Ford Overton, chairman of the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. What, what a great evening. It was spectacular for an awful rainy night. It was amazing. We had over 85 people show up to engage with us on on agency projects, and it was certainly good to, to yeah. see that kind of turnout. Yeah, I'm going to tell you the, the openness and the direct questions and the interaction between the citizens of the state of Arkansas that we serve and our staff and our commission really pleased me. A lot of great, a lot of great points, a lot of great comments. I'm just so appreciative, you know, that we could have that opportunity. I do as well, and I'm looking forward to the next one. Yep. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. Rainy, rainy, rainy night, stormy night. I was worried that. Our turnout was going to be very poor, but I'm glad to sit out here and look at everybody that took an interest in being here. And this is important to the commission. It's important to the agency. And so thank you. Let me just start out by that. Um, uh, I'm going to introduce our commissioners here for everybody. And then uh, I'm going to go into um, uh, the reason why we are here tonight. So Joe Morgan um, is from Little Rock. Stan Jones from Walnut Ridge, Bobby Martin from Rogers, Arkansas, uh, Ken Reeves from Harrison, Andrew Parker from Little Rock, and we got J.D. Neely, our newest commissioner from Camden, Arkansas. So, and I'm Ford Overton, chairman of the Game and Fish, and I'm from Little Rock. Uh, I'd also like for our director, Pat Fitz, to uh, stand up, Chris Racy. One of our deputy directors right there, Chris Callclazier, is here as well. Another deputy director, and Tony Davis, are you in the room? There you are back there. We have a number of uh, different staff here tonight as well. Um, we, this is new. This town hall meeting format is new. We don't know what to expect. Okay, so we're excited about it. We've worked to kind of structure it to where this is an open forum. This we serve the public. It's in our mission statement. It's clear in our mission statement to conserve and enhance the Arkansas wildlife and their habitats while promoting sustainable use, understanding getting public understanding and support, okay? In our strategic plan, three key bullet points that we all talk about often involve the public in an open and transparent decision-making process. Improve communication with the public and citizens that we serve. Increased participation with the public that we serve and the issues that we are addressing. We serve the citizens of the state of Arkansas. We're appointed by the governor, serve for the citizens of the state of Arkansas. It is our obligation to sit in front of who we serve and open up discussion so we can answer questions, tough questions, Easy questions, questions that need to be sought through, but this is our opportunity, and I hope it works out well and it's successful so we can continue to move on, but we're excited about this conversation with commissioners, but also it's not just questions that you might have. You might have a comment. We want to hear. We feel like it's our obligation to hear and take note. It's an honor to serve as, uh, with this great commission. We've got uh, Deke Wetbeck, who is the, uh, Deke was here just a minute ago. He is the president of our foundation. Deke has done a wonderful job. Deke is a very big advocate of the commission and the agency, and he was here just a minute ago, and I thought I'd point him out, but he must have moved on. So um, we're going to show uh, a video 
and we're going to have three quick presentations after that. So why don't we roll that initial video and we'll go from there. Arkansas, the natural state. From the Ozarks and Washita's to the Delta and Coastal Plain, our nickname is well-deserved. And for more than a century, the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission has been working to keep the state true to its name. 28.6. The men and women of the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission dedicate themselves daily to conserving the state's most precious natural resources. Managing the habitats that support fish and wildlife and provide public opportunities, to enforcing the state's hunting and fishing regulations, our work is all about passing along a conservation legacy to future generations. After European settlement and the widespread landscape changes that came with it, many species were either wiped out or pushed to the brink of extirpation. But the Game and Fish Commission boasts an impressive history of bringing back numerous species. There was a time when just seeing a deer track was cause for celebration, but now Arkansas hunters annually harvest more than 200,000 whitetails, including some extraordinary bucks. The Game and Fish Commission's mid-20th century work to restore black bears to the state is considered one of the most successful species reintroductions in the world. Land purchases and the construction of lakes have put quality outdoor experiences in reach of everyone, and the Commission's expansive hatchery system helps to maintain robust fish populations. Mandatory hunter and boating education has made the state's woods and waters safer for everyone. Keeping the natural state true to its name requires a concerted effort by nearly 600 employees. Wildlife officers work around the clock to ensure compliance with the state's hunting and fishing laws. Game and fish biologists use the latest science to ensure the long-term sustainability of game animals, as well as hundreds of other non-game species that are vital to maintaining healthy ecosystems. Managing wildlife means managing habitat, and game and fish actively manages more than 380,000 acres owned by the agency, in addition to working with conservation partners to help manage another 3 million acres of public land. The Arkansas Game and Fish Commission operates five fish hatcheries that reinforce natural reproduction on the state's 600,000 acres of lakes and more than 90,000 miles of streams. More than 9.5 million fish were stocked last year, and fisheries managers spend countless hours on Arkansas streams and lakes to monitor fish populations and adapt regulations when necessary. There are more than 400 boat ramps and more than 75 fishing piers that provide public access to Arkansas waterways. Game and Fish operates four nature centers and four conservation education centers, which host more than a quarter of a million visitors each year and a new education facility is under construction in Springdale. The agency's popular youth shooting sports and archery in the schools programs reach more than 60,000 Arkansas students every year. The Arkansas Game and Fish Commission is also working to meet present and future challenges. Since the 2016 detection of chronic wasting disease in the state's deer and elk, Game and Fish has tested thousands of whitetails and established regulations to try to prevent the spread of this insidious disease. The creation of a research, evaluation, and compliance division, complete with the agency's first wildlife health veterinarian, 
will help Game and Fish confront CWD and other fish and wildlife issues with the latest science and most effective methods. Feral pigs remain a constant and serious threat to wildlife habitat and native fauna, which is why Game and Fish has devoted almost 65,000 man hours to remove close to 16,000 feral pigs from the landscape over the past five years. The agency's work to bring back the bobwhite quail has resulted in nearly 25,000 acres of quail-focused habitat projects in the past year alone. To maintain the natural state status as one of the continent's most important wintering areas for migratory waterfowl, Game and Fish is working to meet its goals under the North American Waterfowl Management Plan by managing more than 8,000 acres of important moist soil habitat. The agency recently embarked on a plan to conserve the forest and its green tree reservoirs by adapting water management strategies so future generations can enjoy the incredible green timber duck hunting that has made Arkansas famous. One of Game and Fish's newest and most important endeavors is its work to stem the decline in hunting and fishing participation that plagues states across the country. The agency has embarked on an ambitious mentored hunt program to introduce more Arkansans to the joys of the great outdoors and create a new cohort of conservationists who will carry an ethic of stewardship into the future. Conservation comes in many forms. It's getting your hands wet on a cold winter morning to keep tabs on fish populations. It's teaching someone to fish. It's a dedication to service with the knowledge that the work we do today will ensure a better Arkansas for tomorrow. Okay, Luke, um, I'm gonna have Luke Naylor, our waterfowl biologist, come on up and give a brief presentation. Thank you. Uh, everybody hear me? Yep. Good. All right. Yeah, so I've, uh, we'll have a couple folks come after me here, a couple colleagues, and uh, to start this thing off, I, I guess I get the, uh, uh, the great task of uh, taking a bite out of the elephant that may be in the room after the end of the 2018-19 duck season, uh, which was, uh, hope was fantastic for you as it was for me. Um, didn't it change, turned out to be a little bit different? Um, so, so wanted to just make a few comments on that uh, right from the start, and we'll have more time, of course, after this to answer any particular questions people might have. Uh, you know, I think the biggest message that uh, that a year like this can teach us is that uh, variability should be the expectation. Like things constantly change from year to year, but but kind of human nature is to expect things and want things to be the same all the time for, for years after year and, and really decade after decade. Uh, the past few years really have been a, a real slap in the face that that's not true and you can't really expect that. You know, we come off of a couple very dry years, uh, the last two duck seasons, and then in about November, mid-November this year, everybody sh would remember um, a lot of rain. Uh, I was sitting in the office here a week or 10 days before duck season started and there were snowflakes right outside my window here in the office, and that's not normal. Uh, so I think anticipation was really, really high for this for the last duck season we just came off of. Uh, so I, w whenever you have uh, high expectations like that, it, it uh, unfortunately can kind of can set our brains up for failure. Uh, we, we have a high expectations, and if those aren't necessarily met, then it kind of seems worse than w what it may have been. Uh, overall, you know, what did we see last, last winter as, as far as duck numbers? Uh, not, not in front of individuals blind or, or WMA, but, but overall, um, duck numbers were a little bit up in November and about average in December, and then were a bit down in, in, uh, throughout January, early January and late January. So uh, we kind of saw the, uh, what we'd expect from a wet year is to have a few more ducks early, but we didn't have a lot of, once, once December hit, we didn't really have a lot of reinforcing fronts to move birds, and we, when we noticed that in our duck counts, particularly for mallards, they were a fair bit, a fair bit off the long-term average. Uh, you know, in a bigger picture, duck populations have been declining a little bit over time, continentally. 
We talk a lot, and that's kind of something we got to do a better job of. We talk a lot about how duck numbers are just have been high for a long time. We keep setting records. But kind of behind the scenes, there's a lot of habitat, breeding habitat that's been lost, a lot of productivity that's been lost, which ends up with more older birds in the population, generally speaking. That doesn't lead to a one-year shift like people experience this year, but it's part of a long-term trend that uh, I think going forward, we're going to try to do a better job talking about that variability within a high uh, population. Uh, we had great conditions all across the Mid-Continent Mallard Range, through the Mississippi and Central Flyways. Everything was wet. There's some articles out there from Texas. Uh, you know, their duck numbers were up by 30-some by percent. Extreme wet conditions all over the flyway. Mild conditions, not the kind of thing that leads to kind of pushes of birds. Uh, you guys probably noticed that in the field like I did. Um, birds respond to that by changing their behavior. Uh, Biomeda is always kind of an interesting place to hunt as many of you all know probably better than me, uh, but my ears hunting there, you know, birds kind of are here one day, gone the next. You shoot them one day in one spot, then come back to that spot the next day and they're gone, right? Well, that's a direct response to highly available habitat and high hunting pressure. Uh, they're gonna respond to that and go somewhere different. Uh, it happened uh, uh, Western Arkansas up the River Valley. I, I spent a lot of time on Ed Gordon WMA, and typically you can kind of count on in the afternoon, ducks piling out into the areas that are hunted with morning only hunting. This year we didn't even see that. All my time spent out there, the ducks almost entirely switched to nocturnal feeding. Old birds, lots of habitat, heavy hunting pressure. Um, you know, we're, it surprised me when I looked at the data for this year, we're actually sitting on the record, coming off a record, set a new record for duck stamp sales in Arkansas. Over 104,000 hunters bought duck stamps this year, which actually it shocked me. I thought it would drop this year. Uh, you think about the level of pressure that's out there that is, is high, literally as high as it's ever been in Arkansas, the number of people trying to hunt ducks. And that's true across the mid-continent. If you look back to the 1970s when we had a 55-day duck season, not a lot of zone and split seasons, and they're about, ducks were exposed about 700 days, let's say, of hunting, open hunting seasons in the Mississippi Flyway states. This past year, they were exposed to over 1,000 days of open hunting seasons throughout the Mississippi Flyway states. Again. Not, not any kind of th reason to get alarmed about anything. I think it's just a, a recognition that we're in a changing environment. Um, things are constantly going to be in flux. And, and really, the expectation should be for change and for things to not stay the same. Uh, one thing that has been consistent for lots of years is Arkansas is still the destination for ducks and duck hunters. Um, we, will, we don't have harvest numbers till this late summer, but I'm confident we'll be the, in the top three again for duck harvest. Uh, we have been for many, many years, only behind California with a 107-day season in Louisiana that's at the bottom of the flyway. Uh, so we'll have, and mallard harvest in Arkansas is over half a million annually, and, and the next highest state is about half of that. Uh, so this is still the place to be. This is still going to be the place to be for the long term. And I know as an agency, we really just focus our efforts on what we can control, and that's trying to, to do the best keep track of populations, monitor populations, and provide the best habitat we can on both public and private lands. Great. Thank you, Luke. Uh, Corey, do you mind? Uh, Corey is our research, evaluation, and compliance chief, and we've uh, asked Corey to give a brief <laughs> overview of CWD. Thank you all. I appreciate all y'all coming out here this evening and, I guess, fighting through the, the storms and the rain and whatever may be out there. Uh, but but uh, like our commissioner said, I am Corey Gray. I'm the chief of our research division, and our division uh, leads the agency in our response to finding chronic wasting disease. And so since 2016, we've collected over 18,000 samples in the state. We've identified the disease in, in over 12 counties. And so we're going to continue to uh, learn about this disease. We want to continue to collect samples. Dr. Jim Ballard is our wildlife veterinarian. She's here with us this evening and she's leading our effort in chronic wasting disease. So I'm, I'm not gonna belabor the point anymore, but I do wanna thank all the hunters that submit samples for testing. The more samples we, we receive, the, the more that we learn about this disease. And so I wanna thank everyone for submitting samples. And, and to let you know that we're gonna continue to learn about this, this, uh, this bad hand that was dealt to us. That's kinda how I relate it sometimes, is we've been dealt a bad hand. But that doesn't mean we're just going to fold it and go back to the house. We're going to see what we get on the flop. But we're going to play this thing out. The deer's just too valuable in this state to give up on them. So we're going to continue to learn about this disease and continue to move forward. But thank you all again for giving us your evening.
Uh, I'd like to turn it over to Ben Batten. He is our chief of our fisheries division. Thank you, Corey. Good evening, y'all. Uh, welcome. I appreciate everybody taking their time out like everybody else said. My name is Ben Batten. I'm chief of the fisheries division and have been since July of 2018 when uh, Mr. Chris Racy stepped up to deputy director role. I want to say first and foremost that I am proud to lead a team of 92 individuals in the fisheries division that are tasked with managing all the aquatic resources in Arkansas. This is over 200 fish species, all the mussels, crayfish, amphibians, and reptiles in the state. We've got a lot of other things we have to cover, including 600,000 acres of water, more than 50 AGFC-owned lakes, plus a number of other lakes owned by other folks that we co-manage. We've got 90,000 miles of streams, 400 boat ramps, and about 100 fishing piers. You know, fishing is big business here in Arkansas. Every year, we sell about 340,000 resident license and then another 130,000 non-resident license. Uh, most recent expenditures are about half a billion in direct expenditures every year with over a one billion dollar economic impact in the state. I think it's important that folks know uh, and, and the other people that spoke before me would have said the same thing but I'm a fisherman too. Uh, I do a lot of fishing, I dabble in a lot of different species but the thing I do more than anything else is tournament bass fish. I fish a circuit, uh, at least one every year uh, Randy Zellers that writes for us uh, and I fished last year, we're no good at it. We were 15th out of 31, <laughs> but we have a heck of a time doing it and I like getting out there and rubbing elbows uh, with the folks that, that, uh, that love it as well. I think it's important uh, that uh, there's a reason that a lot of bass pros have come out of Arkansas over the years. We sit in a place where there's seven eco regions that all come together really near here in central Arkansas and that leads us to having a lot of diversity everything from you know stumpy AGFC lakes, old oxbow lakes, things like that, big clear core of uh, engineers reservoirs, big rivers, things like that. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities, a lot of uh, d different habitat for folks to hone their skills on. Uh, with just a few minutes to try to cover all that's going on in fisheries, I just want to highlight a couple of great things we go on, we've got going on and then a couple of challenges. First and foremost, we have a lot of passionate anglers that feel very strongly about these resources and a lot of them about specific species. Though it can make ma uh, management challenging at times, we see this as a strength and we're proud to uh, work for you folks. We have a highly dedicated and professional staff that uses science-based management and we're highly connected to our peers, regularly going uh, to meetings both across the southeast and around the country to you know, problem solve with other folks that are facing some of the same challenges we are. This group works really well together and I've been very proud of the way we've attacked some really large scale projects like multi-week habitat projects where we're getting out hundreds and hundreds of trees in a short period of time and uh, sampling events where we've got biologists swarming to hit catfish, alligator gar, whatever it may be and getting a lot of work done in a short period of time. We also are, are fortunate to have a really large staff and uh, infrastructure investment in our fish culture system. Uh, we use this to provide a number of different opportunities. We do it in places like channel catfish in city ponds to, to uh, make uh, good uh, things for beginners to try. We use it for things like uh, the trout fisheries that are so popular. And we also use it to enhance things that we already have going on like our Florida bass stocking program. What we do is not without challenges. We have lots of infrastructure items that are anywhere from 30 to 70 plus years old and are really starting to show their age. These include things like dams, levees, hatcheries, and office buildings. These repairs are all extremely expensive and we've got a big hill over the next couple of decades, uh, but they're absolutely necessary. In, a uh, in addition to infrastructure aging, we also have our lakes <laughs> aging as well. All newly impounded reservoirs are great fishing for the first 10 to 20 years after they're impounded and they steadily get worse after that. Now on our small to medium sized lakes, we can do lake renovations and we can turn those kind of things around, but that's nearly impossible to do on our huge core of engineer uh, kind of reservoirs. The last big challenge that we face is aquatic nuisance species. You've got things like Asian carp, snakeheads, zebra mussels, giant salvinia plants, things like this. Every year, fighting these species is eating up more and more of the precious resources that we have uh, to manage lakes and rivers. So, again, we've got some great things going on. We've got some challenges. Appreciate you all coming out, and uh, thanks for your time. Good job, Ben. Good job, ben.
Okay. Now it's time to, we wanted, the, the goal was to give you a little dose of what we're doing. Updated video, kind of gives you a broad brush. Here we go. Everybody's talking about duck season, how poor it was, whatever all. CWD, it's been a hot topic. Something on everybody's radar, hitting the national press and all this. Fisheries is, obviously Ben's pretty fired up about it. If you don't want to go fishing from here. By the way, he said he was a fisherman himself. Zellers? Yep. Is that true? <laughs> he tries to fish. Uh, anyway, so Trey Reed is going to be our moderator tonight. And I appreciate you doing this. And... Uh, the goal is to not have one or two questions take up the next hour and five minutes. You want to make a comment? You want to have a question that we can answer and we can't immediately answer? We have staff sitting here ready to go, and I'm going to point to Chris Carclasure or Chris Racy or Tony and say, you know what? That's bigger than the next five minutes. And instead of eating up one question that might, you know, we don't, we don't want to eat our whole time up asking about three or four questions. Trey, why don't you take it from here and, um, and let's kick this thing in. Okay? Yeah, let's get going. Thank you all for being here, and uh, thank you, Ford. As you've already seen, we do a lot of different things. We serve a lot of different audiences. And uh, I, th I think to kind of sum up what Ford was saying, we're probably not going to be able to perfectly answer every question tonight, but we're going to do our best. Uh, another thing that we're going to do after this next hour is up, give or take, we've got some tables set up outside. So if you have a question, say, that relates to you know, a little piece of ground where you hunt or fish and you've got a per particular concern about that, we may kind of defer and get you hooked up with one of our biologists or tell you how to get in touch with somebody in that area to perhaps address your specific question. As Ford alluded to, there are also some very big picture questions that we could probably spend the entire hour answering, uh, things that date back long before any of these gentlemen were appointed uh, to, to the commission and before, in many cases, a lot of the staff worked here. So without further ado, we're going to get things started. Jeff Williams right here and uh, Randy Zellers. Randy's in the Nat Gear shirt over here. They've got microphones, and we're going to send folks. They're going to, we'll send them out. I, we've got people that signed up tonight, so I'm going to start with those who indicated they wanted to uh, ask a question. And please remember, it's not just about asking questions. If you've got more of a comment, uh, if you've got suggestions, uh, town hall suggestion box tonight. So we welcome your comments, even if they are not questions. Uh, we've got a lot of staff here with a lot of knowledge and a lot of education and expertise in various subject matters. So we're going to have the commissioners answer questions as well as staff. Um, just want to remind everybody, let's be uh, civil and on our best behavior. We can, be, uh, we can disagree without being disagreeable. So uh, first question is uh, Jeremy Miller from Greenwood. Jeremy, where are you? Hi, I come from Greenwood, Arkansas. And my question is the regulation you all have about uh, prohibited turkey hunting over bait. You know, I agree with it. But I was wondering why there is no set distance that you have to be from the bait. I mean, there is no set distance you can kill a turkey from bait. So I'm just wondering, is there any way we can set a distance to clarify it? That way other hunters will know they're legal. I mean, because your neighbor could have bait out. I mean, somebody could be feeding cows. I mean, whatever. I just wanted to That's set. That's a good question. Okay. Jer Jeremy called me about this, and so I contacted our new turkey coordinator, and matter of fact, I think you even sent it an email with yes, the same sir. question. So our new turkey coordinator, I think, is going to respond to that. There he is. And I do think it's a good question. All right. Can you all hear me? Yeah. All right. Well, I'm Jeremy Wood. I'm the new turkey program coordinator. I started back at the end of August last year. Um, so listen to the microphone. All right. Um, Turn it up back there if you don't mind. Yeah, go. All right. Um, so this regulation predates me by quite a bit. I think it's been in place probably since the early 2000s. Uh -huh. 
Um, currently, our regulation follows along with basically what the migratory bird rule is on baiting, and there's no set distance there. Um, and that's due to the fact that it's kind of a case-by-case -case basis. There's a lot of things that go into baiting. Um, and it's basically in place to go over whether or not there's, you know, any sort of intent on, you know, tracking those birds to that yeah. area, you know, or over that area. Um, but at this point in time, we're not prepared to make any sort of recommendations as far as a distance. You know, we're in the middle of our regulation cycle. And we'll likely take a look over this over the next year or so for right. our next race. Well, I mean, just like Oklahoma, all these other states have set distances that you have to be. And just like the USDA's trapping hogs, two properties over from me, my property borders Chappie. You know, you have neighbors that may have bait out. If there's a set distance, then I know that I am can get on my property to be away from, from the corn and be legal. I mean, it shouldn't be up to the discretion of every single officer. That's kind of like setting a speed limit that says don't speed but then the cop not knowing, I mean, leaving it up to every officer to decide if, you know, you're speeding. But the person doesn't know if they're speeding or not. Hey, Jeremy, let me let, let me ask something. Yes, sir. Uh, is G-Ray in here? No, sir. Okay. How would enforcement enforce this situation? Okay, I mean, I, I'm, I'm putting you on the spot, I know, but yeah. I'm just saying, he's asking, he's asking a specific question, and yes, I think we yes, need sir. to come up with a better answer. Uh, it, it is a good question. Uh, there's other states that do have a, uh, a distance, a uh, set distance. I think if, uh, you know, every uh, incident, we'll call it, is different, um, but it, it is ultimately on the officer's back to make that decision. Uh, the reg, uh, or the the definition of baiting, uh, the key word in there is area. You right. know, but there's uh, no definition of area. It, I understand. I understand. And you understand that we have to go with right. what's in place right, right. now. So, uh, so it is a good question. Um, and like I said, they're going to, they're going to make the recommend, you know, they're going to make that uh, decision as far as to issue a citation or warning. Um, you know, in most cases, I can tell you it's it's gonna you're gonna have to be pretty close to the bait. Pretty close would be you know in the line of sight. Uh, I can't get to a specific case, but uh, you know every officer's seeing something different. I can't. Right, and that's my point. I mean, it's up to the discretion of every officer. And if there was a set distance, there would be a defined area. You know, if it's 100 yards, 100 yard radius, that's a defined area. You yes, know. Sir. Yes, sir. One point to the other. Yes, sir. Like I said, it's a great question. I'd love to talk to you about it after. Hey, I'll Jeremy, that's exactly why we're here yeah. tonight. Yeah, and Jeremy, I'll, I'll, show <laughs> well, you I'm you, I'll show you this. At our next reg cycle, I will bring this question up again because I've had the same concern you've had for many years. We've got the issue of the word area, and we also have the issue of on or over. Yes, sir. And I think those uh, well, may thank those to be more clear. To no, time. thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank Thanks, you Jeremy. Your Joel time. Rawls. Where's Joel? Right here. All right, go for it. We've seen our turkey population decline, our harvest decline, 20,000 to roughly 8,000. I'm just curious if we might, I don't want to step on toes, but maybe see it drop to one turkey for a while. We can bring it back up. You know, we've harvested two ducks, three ducks, back up to six. You know, you take some of these WMAs, you're not seeing the quality of a hunt you'd want to have, per se, as you would like. Is that, I mean, dropping to one, is that even considerable? I'm going to repeat the question because this is being recorded and will be on our, our YouTube channel tomorrow. But he's asking about p potential of, of dropping with the declining turkey harvest over the past several years. Would we consider dropping to a, a single bird limit? Well, I'll, I'll talk that one too because I turkey hunt every day I can. Uh, we're not alone in this decline in turkeys. And we have a slide that shows it's all over the southeast. And it's been going on for a long time. I, I started hunting back when there's birds. You heard three or four birds gobble every time you went out. I share your frustra frustration. We're trying to do this incrementally. We shortened our season. Then we started opening on Monday instead of Saturday so we wouldn't just you know, most of the birds were being killed that first weekend. And, you know, we have other options. Missouri has a model you can only kill one gobbler the first week. That's something we're going to consider and discuss. 
dropping the limit to one bird is something that will be considered and discussed. We have a new turkey coordinator who has excellent credentials. We're going to give him a chance to get his feet on the ground and get a feel for what's going on here and see what he recommends for our next, next regulation cycle. But what you've suggested will be a consideration. And thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, next person that signed up to ask a question is Cody Kemp from Hot Springs. Cody? We again. I mean, yeah. th these mics are, are feeding into our, our video feed as well. So, I have. I mean, I have a lot of questions um, for you guys and any of these guys that have uh, sat with me. I'm uh, Cody Kemp, uh, own outdoor store in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Um, I run Mr. Bass of Arkansas, own Mr. Bass of Arkansas Tournament Trail. Um, the late Porter Everett, Ronnie Everett, uh, ran that. You guys probably remember those guys. Um, but uh, my main question that I wanted to uh, ask today, and I've actually talked with. Um, these guys, Ben and Jason, before is um, prioritization. And one thing I'm working on a lot or trying to work on a lot is communication between Arkansas Game and Fish and the bass community, the bass anglers, um, and, and improving that. And uh, one thing that, that I think we're missing still is prioritization of um, resources, prioritization of funds, and how we do that. Um, and so, so my question is, you know, how, how do you guys or how are you prioritizing the funds allocated for the Arkansas Game of Fish um, and the fisheries to hunting, to turkey, to so on? How is that prioritization happening? Um, in, in a previous life, I, I was a continuous improvement guy, and we, we based everything off of business impact uh, and then ease of implementation via cost, resources, so on. And so my main question is, how does the Arkansas Game of Fish Commission prioritize um, their allocation of funds, resources, um, and so on. Well, we thank you for your question, and, and, and I'm going to I'm going to ask you back to be a little more specific. We have agency goals that our director sets for us. Like our number one project right now is Northwest Arkansas Nature Center. Okay, regional office and nature center. I mean, then we have uh, private lands development. So. Be a little more specific because Ben and Chris would develop the fisheries budget and where the money goes within the fisheries division. So I'm trying. I want to make sure. That's we're the main, I mean, that's where I'm focusing most. Okay. Um, and and the fisheries. reason, yeah, the reason is is because the outdoor industry is growing at a, an unbelievable pace right now, and that's led by fishing. It's led by bass fishing with the new trails, major league fishing high school fishing, so on. So my main question is how in overall can we prioritize better bass fishing um, and, and how do we communicate that prioritization to our bass anglers um, of business impact or uh, ease of implementation cost? How is that prioritized? Um, and how can we communicate that better to our anglers? Because um, just as we spoke before the meeting, if we can communicate that, why we make the decisions we're making they will better understand and understand things are happening. And that's my biggest goal is you guys are working your tails off on stuff, but we're not communicating that well enough that this is why we're doing it. And that's what I think is really important. And once you get all of these bass anglers on your side, I honestly believe you'll get a lot of help from them. Have, have you visited with Ben in particular about this topic or your question? Okay. A little. All right, then maybe y'all can take a deeper dive. You, know, you, you, want, you want to take a quick stab at it, or y'all want to talk about that after the – look, Cody's going to share his no, microphone. No, I, I don't mind. There's, there's a couple questions I want to make sure that I'm understanding. There's one question. If Are you asking fisheries takes what budget they have, how do they decide to spend it, or are you asking how does the agency decide what fisheries gets versus somebody else? Both. But, but first, <laughs> he, he, wanted, he wanted me to find out – if I wanted to narrow it down, it's fisheries. That's, that's what I'm mainly wanting is how do you prioritize your budget? If your budget is cut, for instance, how do you prioritize spending it over here versus over here? And then not only funds, how do you allocate resources to work here versus over here? That's, that's what I'm, I'm most curious about. And those decisions, because you have your 92-person team, how do you allocate them fact-based? And, um, and, and how can we improve the communication of that to our anglers? No, that's a great question, and the, the uh, you know try to answer it really quickly in a forum like this, which is difficult. Uh, you know, if I had more money, there's more things I would do. Fisheries operates off with a strategic plan that we have set up, taking science, angler input, everything we have, 
and we have goals and objectives and we're not always able, you know, we're not, no, in fact, we're not able to fulfill all those goals and objectives, but I would say that other folks would say that same, uh, same deal. Uh, you know, a lot of the work that folks do that, that you're interested in, black bass particularly, uh, is chopped out at the district level. You know, we have 10 districts around the state that do different work. And so, um, you know, it's hard, it's hard to say exactly what uh, district does, does what. I mean, we're always looking at creel surveys, things like that. And we are trying to do our best to put our resources where people are using the most or where we think we can make the most difference with our management on the ground. Um, that's a short answer and a tough question. Happy to deep dive with you, but uh, maybe that's a, a good question to, to take back up at, at one of the tables after the uh, after this uh, question and answer forum is up. I mean, unfortunately, we're probably going to all be disappointed a little bit, both people asking questions and those of us answering, because we could talk about this all night. But uh, just so that everybody gets a chance to, to ask their question, Ron Plate is next up. Ron. We need it for, for recording purposes. Okay. I'm Ron Plate. Uh, I'm with Arkansas Bass Nation. Two questions kind of off of Cody is uh, prioritization. I think the angler in Arkansas would love to see is prioritize one lake. It could be Washtal, DeGray, to his large, with a Florida strain largemouth to try to bring a, you know, get, get a trophy bass lake back in Arkansas. And secondly, helping run a couple of tournament trails myself. Seemed like a lot of the anglers are. When we go in morning, a lot of these Arkansas uh, core ramps where we pay a fee are not lit up. And I don't know if that falls under the Corps of Engineers or yourself, but it seems like we got a lot of ramps that basically there is no lighting. I mean, it just you pull up and you, you know, you have to you, you depend by your what your own lights are to, to light up the, the parking lot and the launch and stuff. So. Thank you. All right, uh, next is Alan Perkins from Little Rock. Alan. Thanks. Well, we're, I guess we're on a theme here because I'm going to continue talking about fishing. Um, the bass fishermen clearly got here first. Follow up some on, uh, on Cody Kemp's comments and, and, and use a few more statistics. So in Arkansas, using the 2011 nationwide survey of hunting and fishing, which the Game, uh, Game and Fish Commission uses. Um, it's the most recent nationwide survey where the information is broken down by states. There's an update in 2016, but it's only national and regional. Arkansas led the nation uh, with in-state residents that spent uh, a number of days fishing, 28, highest in the country um, in the state of Arkansas. In, in 2016, in their updated report, uh, in fishing nationwide increased about 18 about 8 percent but hunting decreased about 19 percent so participation and interest of the public in fishing is increasing but hunting is decreasing now here's some other numbers uh, from the 2011 survey there are 363,000 hunters in Arkansas 555,000 fishermen 52 percent more uh, they, the hunters spent a little over 10 million, almost 11 million days hunting, uh, but there were almost 16 million days spent fishing. Now, the, the dollars are different. Um, hunters spend a little more on their sport on average, a little over a billion dollars, uh, whereas hunters spend about half a billion. That's, that's about 49% of the, the amount. But let's compare that to the Game and Fish Commission budget. Uh, we have 35% of the 2017-18 commission budget uh, dedicated to wildlife management and only 11% um, dedicated to fisheries management, uh, about 31%. So even though we have more fishermen, they spend more days fishing and about half the amount of money fishing, they have less than a third of the amount of the commission budget that's devoted to fisheries management. And I think that's a, a disparity that at least needs to be explained. I know there are lots of issues. I understand Pittman-Robertson, the, the, uh, the excise tax on marine fuel sales and those sorts of things. It's a complicated issue. I'm not saying that, that, aha, we have to adjust the budget and make them equal or something like that. But it is an issue that I think needs to be further discussed. Um, <clears throat> and not tonight, but uh, perhaps 
in you know in a more detailed forum uh, where some uh, fishermen would get together with um, Game and Fish Commission people and talk about you know the future and why why we're spending where we're spending uh, related to fishing. Uh, now to drill down a little deeper, uh, black bass. By the way, just full disclosure, um, my son and I own a fishing store in Sherwood called Fish and Stuff. Um, we cater to uh, tournament fishermen primarily, tournament bass fishermen, and all fishermen, but that's, that's certainly uh, a big part of our income um, goes to tournament bass fishermen. We also run a, um, the Tuesday night tournament on the, on the Little Rock Pool of the Arkansas River. It's been around for how many years, Jacob? 31 years. Um, it runs every other Tuesday evening all through the summer. We have a classic in the fall. Um, and <clears throat> what we have, the facility we have, is underneath the interstate with a small metal partition um, for us to set up in. The parking is terrible. Um, there, really, there are only two tournament weigh-in facilities on the entire reach of the Arkansas River from Oklahoma to Tennessee. One's at the State Park in Dardanelle. One is at Dumas, uh, the Pendleton Ramp, which was partially funded by the local bass club. Uh, and we're in, in dire need of better facilities to serve this, this very large, very energetic, very supportive, would be very supportive segment of Arkansas sportsmen. Um, and it would allow us also to attract more tournament fishing. It has a huge impact on local communities, economic impact. Um, I could go on and on about that. Not that business is the end all and, and be all of game and fish management. I understand that. Um, but um, it also opens up opportunities, I think, for the Game and Fish Commission to partner with the Economic Development Commission, local governments. A lot of local governments will uh, sponsor and give uh, funds to bass tournaments to come because they're such an economic engine to their local community. Um, the Game and Fish Commission could do a better job trying to tap into that to cooperate with them as well as the bass anglers and bass clubs um, to try to get facilities where they're needed and where they would um, serve the biggest inter in, uh, interest of the, the community. The, the Black Bass Management Program uh, I'm impressed with. Um, they've made a lot of strides and uh, I like the uh, lake management report. But uh, the, the Black Bass Management Report for the Game and Fish Commission doesn't include rivers. The Arkansas River is a tremendous bass fishery. It spans the entire width of the state of Arkansas. And I can tell you that our clientele, who are probably majority river bass fishermen, or that's their favorite, um, don't feel like uh, their interests are being served, that there's any real um, expression of, of black bass management on the Arkansas River system. I know that rivers are harder to manage than lakes, um, which are somewhat uh, enclosed, and it's easier to manage a population when you have good boundaries. But that doesn't mean there's nothing that can be done. And uh, we would like to see that addressed. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. No, no thank you. No, those, are, those are very good points. I'd, I'd also like to invite you and your son to come back in March uh, to our committee meeting a month from what, what day is that would that be we, we, or, or any future month yeah just come back and, and line this out and lay it out in front of us in a committee environment where we can write specifics down Ben can take note of them we can educate you on what we've done so it, but also learn from what you're recommending okay I didn't know there were Tuesday night tournaments I'd like you to know, know you know, Mr. Chairman, I've, I've got to ask this question just for full disclosure. Y'all are not related to Ben, right? I just, I just want to know. Because he's been trying to get us to change the name of the Arkansas Fishing Game Commission. But. <laughs> All right, where's hey, Tim Daly? I'll be pretty short with mine. This has to do with duck hunting. And it, uh, I think in the last five years, we can all admit that the duck populations have declined in Arkansas. There's going to be one or two reasons. The population count is wrong. The numbers are wrong. And 
they're being short stopped or they're being short stopped up north of us in Missouri and Illinois. You know, we used to be able to see Canadian geese here that come in. We used to have Canadian geese hunting. Well, the only ones we see now, it's on the golf courses <laughs> and for our resident geese. But I think we need to really look at seriously at maybe reducing the number of days that our seasons, our duck seasons are, and reducing the limits. And that would help take the pressure off the ducks. We're going to have to do something to reestablish the flyway in Arkansas. It's going to be that is a treasure that we are going to lose if we don't do something about it. Thank you for your comment. All right, next up is Charlie Hart from North Little Rock. Charlie? So public ground versus private ground. Why are the rules different? Like spinning wing decoys? That's one. Okay. Half day, yeah. all day. That's another. Okay. It was shot shell for a while. I think y'all changed that. Do we have somebody that could answer that? Um, what? Stan, you want your question is why are the rules different on WMAs than they are on private ground? Yes, sir. Well, you know, I have a lot of private ground and I definitely uh, manage my private ground differently than probably state ground is managed. Anyone can go on to the state ground and hunt and take as many people as you want to. On private ground, we kind of limit what we do and where we go. Um, I don't ever hunt in the afternoons on my private ground, never. and. You know, like, for instance, that 10 days in between the split, that first nine or 10 days comes in, then we got a split of 10 days. Well, I'd never allow anybody driving around my fields or on my farm to scare the ducks out. But the WMAs, you know, you got boats and motors and people running there all the time. So what, what are we trying to do here, get more ducks into the, the uh, WMAs? You know, man, private ground is managed a little bit different than public ground is. We're trying to get our public ground better. This year, we went up and visited Otter Slough, Duck Creek, and Mingo, and just looked at their moist soils. We come back down here and we looked at ours, and our moist soils, I'm a farmer, and I know every weed in these moist soils. Our moist soils was better than Missouri's this year. This year, we planted some corn, some milo, and some food plots in our WMAs in Hurricane in uh, uh, Dave Donaldson, Rainy Break, and Big Lake. We planted some actual food plots in them to make it better for our ducks. We even rented some fields around these WMAs so that the WMAs wasn't flooded in October like they used to be. And so we wanted to keep our ducks in the flyway and keep our ducks coming and have places for them to eat. We're making a great attempt to make our game better. We're trying to up our game and, and every year we're going to get better with what we're doing. But you know you got general public that goes out there and everybody everybody's not the same. Everything, it's relative. You got good hunters, you got hunters that that don't care. You got hunters that's going out there for just a boat race. You got hunters that have nothing to do that just go out there and so it, it's different in a, in a uh, state agency WMA than it is a private ground. So that's why the rules are different? Well, no, there's, there's, you I mean, know, I, I think probably Luke needs to answer the shots back at uh, the difference in the shells. You talking about that? And I, I think y'all might have changed that. It doesn't affect me where I hunt. Um, spinning wings, years ago, it was yeah. statewide banned. Luke no, probably needs to answer that. Everybody knows that the yeah, other states didn't follow. Yeah, that's gone back and forth a little bit. The spinning wing decoy thing was uh, uh, Arkansas kind of stepped out there to ban it. There's a <coughs> what year was Arkansas. that, Luke? Do you remember when uh, they banned it? Well, my time was 05. 04. 04. I think it was. Ish. Yeah. Because it came in, got really popular in 99 and 2000, and I think it was somewhere in the 03 to 05 range. There was a lot of talk <laughs> within the flyway to, to get a moratorium on them nationally, and that didn't go anywhere. Uh, but Arkansas kind of stepped out and said, hey, we're going to ban them uh, statewide. A few years went by, then in 2008 brought them back statewide, then uh, continued some commissioners that, that predate these, these gentlemen. Uh, we, we, 
that was really the number one issue that we got public comment about is please ban spinning wing decoys on public land. That, that was far and away the, the largest amount of comment we got from the public, from WMA hunters. We so say you take away spinning wing decoys on public land. And it was really a, a hunt quality issue. Uh, Michigan has experimented with this a little bit and done some, uh, done actually hunter surveys and they tra tracked uh, harvest and satisfaction of hunters with and without spinning wing decoys. And, and so the commission at that point in 2011, I think, uh, it was one of your first early years, 12. It was 12, yeah, that, that went back and said, no, we're gonna, we're gonna do what we can on WMAs with, um, we got a, it's basically a balancing act when you're trying to manage public access on, on, and public hunting satisfaction, success, a lot of things that are out, our, uh, out of our control. It's a balancing act to put a bunch of people all in one spot and try to get the best experience for, for the most of the people who are there. And that's, that's to keep ducks in there with morning only hunting, to try to provide some some sanctuary throughout the day uh, to keep higher duck use in there. That's a common practice across the country. Uh, private and public land managers use that as, as a tool to try to increase duck use and, and sustain duck use. Uh, the spinning wing decoy was, was a hunt quality issue. We heard from it consistently from 2008 through 2011 that hunt quality has declined on public lands because of the heavy use of spinning wing decoys. Uh, we took that action, the commission took that action to, to ban them as a hunt quality issue on, on public lands. Uh, shell limits, uh, another idea, I mean, I think they've, we haven't removed any of them in a few years. No, um, I, I don't think we've touched. We didn't, they're still at Bell Slough, Shire Bay, Biomeda, there's a couple of, uh, uh, maybe Boat Arc in <coughs> southwest Arkansas has them. They've been kind of in place for You know, look, I, I don't years. want to cut you off, but I mean, we, we will get a lot of questions. Yeah, well, I was, to, we've but got I, a bunch of them. Yeah, I know Trey will cut us all off, but I, I hope. You know, from a commissioner side, what you hear is, you know, the regulations are never there to take things away. They are usually like when we were getting ready to touch on the, the shell limit. Well, that was a response to a lot of complaints and so forth from the public about sky busting and the likes. And, and whether it's an effective solution or not, you know, it's still being argued and debated. But at the end of the day, I think the answer to your question, I, I hope is acceptable, is every one of these steps are an effort to you know, provide a more successful experience, more successful for the habitat, for the wildlife, the waterfowl, and certainly the hunter. Uh, we don't like regulations from the standpoint of doing it because we know we always take something away, but they're usually in response uh, to an effort to try and make things better. Yeah, I have no problem with the regulations. I just don't see why it's not statewide since y'all control the state. Thank, thanks for your comments, Charlie. We're going to move on. We've only got, uh, Thank you. We, I've got well over a dozen more uh, people signed up, and we're halfway through our hour. So uh, the next guy's not a, a, a great uh, rider, but he is a, one heck of a bass fisherman, George Cochran. <laughs> I've seen your signature before. I wouldn't have known it was you. <laughs> fish, wouldn't you? Yeah, you know. <laughs> and, and that's why I think it's so important and you guys know this, you know, not everybody can afford to go to a club. And it's so important, those 60 days to duck hunt, and I think it'll go back because of the number of ducks, you know, to 45, 50 like it used to be. And uh, I think it's so important that you give the public, these, we got the best management areas in the United States, and I know you're worried about the trees, you know, and all that. Well, you need to cut them let the little ones grow back up but getting to the question is that since we mulched all game and fish did since you mulched all those sloughs in that water when you want to get it off there it falls fast but the danger i saw this year and i hunt just like i fish all the time i noticed this year that when we had a and it was an unusual year i agree the water was up and down up and down because of the rain. And I noticed it by a meter. When it get up, boy, they'd pull them gates and you could see the water running out of it. And them ducks would leave. They hate falling water, as any duck hunter knows. What's your question? The question is, I'd like you to study it because when you're, you know, we'd have two or three good duck hunting days and then we'd notice that water would be falling, falling. Then we wouldn't have any good duck hunting. We'd have to move, be mobile. 
we'd have to go to the Arkansas River or somewhere else. And then once it gets stable, if we'd see a few ducks come back and then we get a big rain, boy, it'd fall off like a rock. I just wanted you to study the damage it does ne necessarily for the duck hunters as well. But you know, 50 days is important for those 60 days for a duck hunter. And I hope we get to hunt 60 days every year because thousands and thousands of people depend on it that can't go to a club. Like, yeah, but we don't pull the gates. I mean, I don't, I don't understand what you're saying about the microphone. The well, there's be people to argue with you on oh. that. <laughs> Uh, oh, you know, okay. I lived down there during duck season. Well, you, you when we have argue a big right rain, they not? pull them gates to get it down to a certain level. That's right. what I'm talking about. We, well, do you think the amount of rain and the amount of water that goes in there, a lot of that water has to be let off? If I it's understand not, that. You and have it was, damage it to was the different. It was different in the old days because they put the gates in and leave them in. And the ducks didn't pay much attention to it. It fall real slow or it come up, you know. But now it's different because it's man made. The way that water comes out of there so fast, you know, it'd be just like your club. You know, you get a big rain, you go over there and pull a gate and let it fall two foot, you wouldn't have any ducks. That's what's happening. Yeah. And I just, I wanted the game fish to study it. I mean, the woods would even be muddy. You couldn't hardly walk in them after the water falls so much in, in shallow water. I think they ought to study it, see if it does any damage to the trees too. Good, thank you for your okay. comment. Thanks, George. Next is... Uh, hey, Trey, hold on. Is Bobby Joe here? <laughs> is Bobby Joe here? I'm glad he you're here. <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get to you in a minute. Uh, Howard Conaway is, uh, is next. So, uh, <clears throat> I've been hunting, turkey hunting, over in the... Western Arkansas since early 70s. And, uh, you know, I'll probably go over there for a few days first of season this year. But my hunts lately have been sort of nostalgic hunts. And so everybody talks about, yeah, the turkey population's really decreased. And, you know, that's a big area over there. And everybody talks about habitat, habitat. You know, that's, does the game and fish have any ideas on how the habitat has changed why it does is it did that affect the decrease the per turkey population? Is anything we can, being done about it? That's my question. I might offer up a comment on that. Um, I'm a big turkey hunter too, and a forester. And I I will say this: we don't do quite as much burning as a, as an industry wide like we used to. Uh, some of our thinning practices because of ownership changes we're used to you had a lot of company ownership and they've converted to REITs and TMO groups um, they don't do as much spraying herbicide work which controls the underbrush uh, a turkey really does not or any ground nesting bird does not do well uh, in a thicket understory they need disturbance they need quicker thinning practices, they need brush control, they need burning. And so we have seen in the Gulf Coastal Plain where I am, probably over there in the western side of the state where you are, uh, some decrease in habitat due to some of these forest practices changing over the last 10, 12 years. Oh, I'd say that area where I've been hunting has been burned over twice in the last 12 years probably, so. Howard, another where I live, we have have turkeys and used to have quail, but now we've got more coons. Everybody's quit coon hunting. Uh, pigs, unbelievable amount of pigs, and and you can imagine they love turkey and quail eggs. So we're kind of dealing with some different circumstances now, not just habitat, but that than we used to have a long time ago. <coughs> Nobody coon hunts anymore. Used to a lot of coon hunters. But, you know, I can make a circle every day and see 10 or 12 coons just, and we've got way too many. Thank you for your All comment. Right. Thank you, Mr. Conaway. Uh, next is uh, this having a hard time, and I don't have his autograph on a bass fishing cap. So uh, uh, looks like Tommy Cordell or maybe Connolly. Cordell. Cordell. It is Tommy, though. It is. Man. <laughs> it's pretty descriptive. 
Anyway, I'm from the eastern side of the state. I'm St. Francis County, Zone 4B. And uh, here two or three months ago, we got a petition together. Y'all probably seen it. I, uh, I was told it was pre uh, presented to you with over 200 signatures on it. We would like to have a rifle season in 4B for just the 12 days. We just have 12 days to gun hunt as it is, shotgun and, uh, you know, muzzleload or shotgun. I was raised shooting rifles up until I acquired the place where I hunt now. But uh, like I said, there was over 200 signatures on that uh, that uh, thing that we sent for y'all to look at. We would appreciate it if y'all would consider giving us a rifle season in those 12 days because there's really no difference in, I live I live between two highways, Highway 70 and Interstate 40. <laughs> I can throw a rock on the, on the side where you can't hunt, and I live on the side where you could hunt with a rifle. But anyway, that uh, the guys that have asked me to come over here and confront y'all with this and see if you could make a decision to give us the 12 days of rifle season. What's confusing to our guys over there, you can take a 7-millimeter magnum and cross that interstate and shoot coyotes, but you can't shoot a deer with a 7-millimeter. It don't make sense to us. So we just ask, we're not asking for 30 days or 60 days of deer season for a gun. We're just asking to give us the 12 days that we have to gun hunt. Give us a chance to rifle hunt. How, how long has that regulation been like that? How many years? Oh, Lord, I don't I, I don't know. I didn't uh, yeah. look to see. 80s? 80s. Probably. ought to be looked at. He said 4B, right? 4B. That's that's north of I-40. Hey, thank you for that comment. And, Brad, you're well aware of that. Two, okay. All right. Thank, thank you, sir. Th hey, thank, thank you, you for taking time to come. Thank you so uh, much. Next up is uh, Grant Westmoreland. Grant took off. I heard him say earlier. Hey, he Trey, I, I'm going yes. to uh, exercise something. I'm going to call on uh, fellow Commissioner Reeves here. Because I think Howard, when he was asking his question, I'm – I'm afraid we missed an opportunity to share something that is important to all of us as commissioners. His first question really was, you know, how much do we really pay attention to habitat, habitat change? And Ken, I mean, you've been a big champion of what we're trying to do with private land, our private land biologists, and everything we've tried to do with quail. It also is for turkey as well. And I think so. the answer is yes on habitat, but maybe it's a good time to kind of share what our expectations are with our private land biologists. Right. Okay, well... The, the reason that we've had this incredible decline in quail, which I, I started quail hunting my dad over 60 years ago when it was great. I mean, field and stream came to Harrison, Arkansas. My dad took them hunting, and they wrote an article about it. And now, you know, we're probably 20 years too late getting started on this project, but we're, we're determined to give it our best to try to bring the quail back. Quail and turkeys are both ground nesting birds. The reason for their decline is a, is really, really a lot of things. And we mentioned coons. You know, I, I, I made this comment at our last meeting. No one coon hunts. I, I live in the northwest part of the state where people used to coon hunt a lot. No one does that anymore. And I know trappers. I've actually used some trappers on a place that I lease. They get like $5 for a coon hide. Well, you get your game camera pictures and of your, your feeder, and there's six raccoons hanging off of it. I mean, it goes on all night long. That's one reason, because they, they eat quail eggs, they eat turkey eggs, so do roadrunners, so do hawks that we cannot control. They're federally protected. So you got all these different reasons. A lot of people think chicken litter. A lot of people think fertilizer. The list goes on and on, and they're all true. But like on the quail where I live, when we had all these quail, it wasn't beef cattle country in Boone County. Now everywhere you look, it's Bermuda and fescue, and it's about that tall. And you don't have well bar fences anymore, so the animals reach through there and they eat on both sides, so you don't have fence rows anymore. It's all about habitat. I mean, there's a lot of reasons they're gone, but the only reason, the only way they're going to come back, quail particularly, is habitat. Now, turkeys, the habitat may be not as critical. We've got lots of turkey habitat, but the, I really think we can't control the cold weather in the spring, you know, for the hatch time. Um, but, you know, there's states that, north of us that, that have you know, good hatches and have a lot of turkeys. So it's a real challenge, but I think we need to try to control those things we can. And part of that is trying to control 
the predators, and that's something that we're going to look at as we go forward. It, I'm going to add one thing to that that I think Bobby was tipping you on is we have private lands biologists. We have 16 private lands biologists that we've, heck, I don't know, Brad uh, or, or uh, Director, when I came on the commission in 12, did we have, enough, we had what, a couple? Eight to ten, we just put on, so we've rounded it to sixteen. Ninety percent of the land mass of the state of Arkansas is privately held. Ninety percent. So, if these private lands, we see the private lands biologist program as our success for the future, because on ten percent of state or federal owned land, you're not going to be able to accomplish much. We've got to get these private landowners burning getting native grass back and, 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 and following suit. Partnering. What's that? Partnering. partnering, yeah, partnering from all practical purposes. And the video showed earlier that uh, we've, had, <coughs> we've had good success to get 36,000 acres on this year with our private lands biologist. I think it is Brad, somewhere around in there. But w that is going to be the key to success in bringing back quail and turkey to the degree that we need is partnering with private lands. Next up is uh, Brett James from Little Rock. Brett. Yes, sir. I kind of had a turkey question as well. First of all, I'd like to thank you all for having this town hall meeting. We're all pretty appreciative, appreciative of it. Um, but I also had a turkey hunting question. Um, you know, I imagine resources and money is probably um, a limiter to all you all can do um, for the turkeys and also other the ducks and deer as well. Um, where do we where do we stand with our working with the Arkansas Forestry Commission and then also maybe even reaching out to the uh, NWTF for, maybe for some monetary help? What are we doing in that? that th th those are great questions that I think can be nailed pretty quickly. And who would like to take that from uh, Brad? Brad? You want to hit it real quick? Uh, those are great questions. Uh, yeah, great questions. Uh, we. Annually, uh, our partnership with NWTF, particularly the state chapter, uh, I think they have 50-something local chapters across the state who raise dollars through their, their local banquets. Uh, we uh, routinely will submit projects for Superfund uh, proposals from, from the state chapter. So those are focused at doing habitat work on WMAs around the state. So we uh, that ranges from roughly Fifty to a hundred thousand dollars a year in dollars from the state chapter that we try to match with our federal dollars so that we do more. Uh, so every year we're in close coordination, submitting proposals to do habitat work on WMAs around the state, and and the amount of that varies with how much money is raised uh, through those local chapters. Uh, we also partner. Uh, you mentioned the Arkansas Forestry Commission specifically, uh, and, and there it's primarily at, uh, at their large ownership at Poison Springs State Forest in, uh, in Washita and, and Nevada County. Uh, but we partner to do work there. Uh, we also, the U.S. Forest Service is probably our largest partner that they have almost two million acres of public land in the state. And so we work cooperatively with the National Wild Turkey Federation and the U.S. Forest Service to do uh, stewardship projects on the Forest Service property. So we're, the, the short answer to your question is that yes, there is a lot of effort and coordination going on to do as much as we can on the ground. Is, is it enough? Are we touching enough of it? No, there's, there's always more that could be done if there were more dollars available. The questions earlier about you know turkey habitat. The the, the short general answer is that, uh, and and Commissioner Neely touched on it, as as we progress through time and there's not active management in our forest, they're becoming more dense, closed canopy. There's little to no understory, and that's that's whether you're talking about private land or public land, and so that 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 is constant across the state. So we, there's a need to do more active management. So I would say from a habitat quality standpoint, turkey habitat is, has probably declined across the state over the past two decades because there's, there's a need for active management, forest thinning, 
prescribed fire are the two main tools there. So, thank you, Brad. Next up is uh, Jacob Perkins. Jacob, hey, um, just like my dad Alan and and Cody expressed earlier, I'm an avid bass angler, but uh, I'm not just held to that. I appreciate y'all doing this, big duck hunter, deer hunter, uh, turkey, everything. So I think this is great. Um, but on to my, I have one short question, hopefully. Uh, if you follow the bass fishing industry community, a lot of people know about the ec epidemic going up on the Tennessee River, uh, Kentucky Lake with the Asian carp. Um, I'm primarily a river guy. I like to fish Pool 6, the Little Rock River, or Little Rock Pool, whatever you want to call it. Um, but specifically down in Dumas, Pendleton, now moving up into the Pine Bluff Harbor and now moving up um, into, uh, you know, Tar Camp, Brody Bend, Little Rock. They're getting worse and worse and worse. They're hopping in boats, hitting people in the head. Is there anything being done? And this may be a Ben question uh, to try to cut that off. Great question, and it is a big issue. Ben? The biggest thing we can do for all aquatic nuisance species is prevent them from getting somewhere in the first place. Once a cat's out of the bag, it's really hard to put it back in. So I've been working on the river since I came to Arkansas, and I've watched them just like you have, creeping up and creeping up, and, and uh, it's really tough. Uh, Kentucky and Tennessee right now are pioneering some things. They've been successful recently getting some funding to help. Uh, the problem is what commercial fishermen are, are, can be paid for them, it's not worth doing it. They're not enough. So what those guys are doing is they're, they're working to get funds to basically supplement that and make it worth their time. I will be next week in Washington, D.C. with six other fish chiefs from around the country lobbying to our congressmen to send more money to the Mississippi River Basin to try to work on exactly that issue. Thanks for your question. That, that is a big deal. Uh, looks like next up is uh, J.H. Pilkington from Greer's Ferry. I don't know whether any of you guys can answer the question or not, <clears throat> but I lived down by Shiloh years ago. I used to have 25 or 30 turkeys across my backyard back there. I moved up into Greer's Ferry, but I still hunt down toward Shiloh. We had a lot of turkey down there. And the game and fish came in and trapped them. We don't have a turkey one around our place and even out at Brownsville where you go down to Cherokee Landing on Greer's Ferry Lake. You used to see them out there. I don't turkey hunt, but I love to see them. So I want to know why the turkeys were trapped out of there. When, when were they trapped? Do you recall, uh, do you recall what, what year they were trapped out of there? Yeah. I have a friend that has a place at Hebrew Springs, and he, he told me the same thing. Really? Yeah. 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 Uh, valid question, uh, and I, somebody pointed out I failed to introduce myself. My name is Brad Carner. I'm the Wildlife Division Chief with the agency. Uh, previously, uh, earlier in my career, I actually was our turkey coordinator from 2001 through 2003. So you're the uh, one that I, I, I don't I don't okay. know. May, may, okay. May have been. You can sit down now, Brad. Uh, Let's go uh, for a I, boat. I, I, I will point out that our our turkey restoration efforts over 50, 60 years included the trapping and relocation of over 7,000 turkeys statewide. So we stocked turkeys in 74 of the 75 counties in the state. I believe Garland County is the only county in the state that we've not released turkeys into. Um, so our, our trapping and, and relocation efforts concluded in about the mid-2000s. Uh, so where, where we were still trapping and relocating birds, it was always uh, from land, willing landowners that were, you know, you know, turkey numbers were high still at that time in most places. And so we generally, as we were stocking areas, we would try to stock about 15 hens and three to four gobblers, jakes or gobblers per site. Uh, as we were trapping on private lands, uh, most cases we were only removing hens. Uh, we, we, were, uh, we would try to trap the gobblers where we had unhunted populations. 
So uh, from the cantonment area at Camp Robinson, for instance, was one that we trapped a lot of turkeys over the years and, and moved around. Uh, Hollow Bend National Wildlife Refuge, which had a very limited season. We, we caught a lot of turkeys and moved from there. But we did, uh, we, we did at that point trap and move birds from the Cleburne County, Van Buren County area where we had landowner permission to move those. And it was usually in places at the time that there were lots of turkeys at the time. But that, that's how we, we sped up our restoration efforts across the state is that we trapped and relocated 7,000 turkeys over about 50 years. Uh, and they have been released into 74 of the 75 counties. I, I don't believe that that is what led or contributed to the point that you say that you're not not seeing turkeys now. I mean, I, we, we're having to decline, you know, pretty much statewide, far outreaching beyond the, the boundaries of our state. Most, most other states in the southeast are experiencing a similar decline in, in turkey numbers. So, but that, that kind of explains the history over our trapping and relocation efforts. Thank we, you, Brad. We've not trapped Thank any you. turkeys in eight, eight years or so and, and don't have any plans to in the foreseeable future. Thank you, Brad. And Brad, it my apologies for not uh, formally introducing you. Uh, James Pilkington is next from Mountain Home. James? Good evening. I give Mr. Chris here a big list of questions. I'm, I'm not going to uh, bring those up. One of the, my main concerns is y'all talk about these surveys that you do. Uh, how many non-resident people do y'all survey when you do send out surveys or take comments from people? Anybody that's uh, human dimensions want to answer yeah. that? <laughs> <laughs> oh. This is uh, Ashley Gramza, by the way. I'm Just, sorry, okay. Brad. Again. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a social scientist with the research division, and I've been similar to actually Jeremy Wood, the turkey coordinator, and I started on the same day. Um, it depends. So some surveys look at, like some hunting surveys look at residents and non-residents to compare them. Um, our last captive wildlife um, proposed regulation public input survey, we only looked at Arkansas residents because that is a regulations change that will affect people within the state, captive wildlife owners that are in the state. So um, does that answer your question? Are you? Okay. I think, Ashley, that we're, we're getting head nods from, from Ben and Jason and others that fisheries does those, is that what we're hearing? What? Jason, you mind, Jason? Go ahead, Jason. This is uh, here, Randy. Here. Jason Olive, one of our assistant chiefs in the fisheries division. Yes, we, uh, we've done resident, a lot of resident surveys. We have a contract out right now doing a non-resident fishing license holder survey that's targeted specifically at non-residents, find out what they're fishing for, what they like or don't like, et cetera, how often they come to Arkansas and things like that. And it's a university researcher who's doing it, and he said he was tickled to do it because nobody, no state's ever survey their non-residents. So anyway, we're being proactive. Uh, our trout program has done uh, phone surveys of, of uh, people who buy trout stamps from people that are from out of state too. So we do some non-resident surveys. The answer is it depends uh, on the particular <laughs> survey. Uh, Brady Bradford from North Little Rock. Brady? Um, I have a couple of questions. I'll be really quick. Um, the first question is, I have a lease that's about 2,000 acres, and there's about three members. We've done extensive uh, habitat management, 15 acres of food plot, harvested like six deer in the last four years, and our deer numbers are steadily declining. And so I decided to take up trapping, and I've wound up killing like 30 coyotes, 10 bobcats, 30 coons, just on my place. The problem is there's a fox pen that's located within five, 10 miles of our lease that borders on the south end of it. And so what they're doing is they're bringing in live coyotes into this pen and chasing them with dogs. Well, there's no regulations in the Game and Fish that regulate these fox pens. I talked to Game and Fish, I talked to our biologist, and there's no regulations. So they, there's 
I mean, nothing to keep these coyotes from coming off, so I'm losing all my deer and my fawns. Sir, where's your place? What it's part of the of, state? It's off of, you know where Lono, Arkansas is, yeah. off Highway 9? Yeah. It's down there. So, I mean, best case scenario, I'd like, I don't understand why we allow transportation of predators into an isolated area anyway, but at least it should be regulated. So that's my big concern there. And then the other one, I just want to reiterate what everyone said about the bass fishing. You know, I have grew up here, moved away, moved back. Probably the last 10 years, I've seen our bass fishery plummet. I mean, it's gotten really bad. Like, I'm here in Lake DeGray. I could go out there on Tuesday night, catch 18 pounds. Now it's nine pounds wins it. The same thing with all these lakes. I mean, we're just, our fishery, our bass fishery is going down and our amount of money we have is going down. It's a correlation. So I've started going outside the state, you know, all over to get some fishing done that's fun. I've even stopped bass fishing a lot because of it. It's just gotten really, really sad. So those are my comments. Thank, Thank you. you for those comments. We're going to move along because we're running quickly running out of time. I, I hope if you... Hey, Trey, can, what we're going to do, let's go to about 10 after 7. There are okay. a lot of people here. We've, We've got been, about uh, a long way. probably about a half a dozen more questions. Well, that, you think that's we fine could, uh, if we have to go to 15 after. That's right. what we're going to do. We're going to make sure we answer questions. I hope I hope you'll avail yourself of the opportunity to talk to some of the folks at the tables uh, out, out back if, if you want to delve deeper. Uh, next up is uh, M.H. Burford from DeWitt. Seems like a lot of people here are concerned about the quality of their hunting and fishing. And I think you guys, you know, should, should hear that. I can definitely say from my experience, the quality has gone down even as the opportunity has gone up. And I think we need to address that. Quality on what kind of hunting or fishing? Uh, the quality of the duck hunting's gone down. Thank you. Crappie fishing, turkey hunting. Deer yeah. hunting. Yeah. Just anything, huh? <laughs> well, I don't bass fish, though. So that, well, that sounds, uh, yeah. Everybody remembers the good old days. Uh, it's a good challenge. Thank just going to hell, uh, isn't it? Uh, Charles Cochran. Charles from, North, uh, from uh, Pulaski. Uh, my name's Charles Cochran from North Rock. I'm really asking this question for my 16-year-old son that couldn't be here, but uh, about two years ago, I think it was, it by meat off a long bell access, a game and fish, y'all cut a road right through the heart of by meat and through the heart of the government cypress. And as I'm walking my son down, down there hunting, and we're tripping over the logs that nobody bothered to get out when they cut the road that you could drive a semi through, down through there. My question is, uh, Commissioner Martin, you said that it's important for the wildlife and important for the people or the hunters. How is cutting roads through the heart of Biomeda that's been there for however many hundreds of years, how is that benefiting the wildlife? And then on top of that, these other roads that you cut, and you cut these holes the size of this room here, for these kids that you say you're against racing boats to, to hunt, that's what they're racing to. They're racing to these holes that y'all created. So how does that benefit the wildlife, I'd like to know. Uh, yeah, let me hand that off to the chair. No. Uh, you know, I, I, the challenge of saying, you know, why are boat trails, boat roads cut? I mean, I would look to our timber biologists and say, what, what was the goal? Uh, I'm, I'm quite certain there was a goal. I can't name it to you today, but I will find out for you. Uh, the question or the statement about how it was left and the condition it was left, I would think that's unacceptable to every one of us as well. Yeah, I, I, you've got my attention. You got all of our attention anyway by, by pushing back on it. Thank you. I mean, you know, we obviously whether it's enforcement or anybody we don't do that to create safety issues or uh, or anything else so those specific issues i don't know government cypress is where i grew up and love as well uh, but i'm quite certain there was a timber management objective that was that was met by trying to do that but if you'll make sure you meet with us out here i'll make sure we get back with you and give you a more specific answer but i, I can't answer that particular i'm just curious from enforcement or wildlife do y'all rec recall uh, a, a road being cut through government cypress How, do you recall when uh, just <laughs> the road that i'm particularly talking about is about halfway down the long bell road uh, on the side of the government cypress and you can't see it from the road but when you're out there you can clearly when you come across it you'll know it runs to georgia you can walk up through there and see a mile long through there and you 
<laughs> coming out, coming northeast out of Long Bell? Going northeast into the government soccer I know where you're talking about, but I don't. I'm against the road, don't get me wrong. But also, if you're going to cut the road, you can't even walk up the road. So it's, it serves no purpose other than, to me, it gets more well, dust and more dust. Yeah, again, I, I'm quite certain that's unacceptable to all of us as well. And Joe, did you know anything about it? didn't clean that road up, you know, to where you could navigate it safely. Um, I'm kind of like uh, Mr. Martin. That, that, that is an issue, and we'll be glad to check into it. So there's all the commission. None of the commissioners know nothing about this road that was cut. I mean, what kind of checks and balances? How, how long ago when, when was, was the road cut? cut? When? How, how, long, how long ago? How long ago did you say it was? Two years ago. Okay. Brad, you got? Do you have any comment about? So just a, a quick background on our process for managing uh, our, our timber sales on our areas. Uh, you know, most cases are, are active timber sales. We have a, a two to three year contract period. Uh, those include access roads to get product in and out. And so as, as conditions get wet, and so there's the potential that trees could remain down out there uh, through a wet period as contractors have to move out. I mean, we'll have to get specifics about that particular area. But we that roughly each year, we have about 4,000 acres of timber sales across our 385,000 acres. So we actively sell and manage just over 1% of our acreage each year. So I, we'll, we'll get more information yeah, about this specific you know, I, sale. I see you shaking your head. So you're not satisfied, and that doesn't satisfy us either. But I'll, I'll make sure I understand. I heard you say you're not objecting to the road. Oh, I'm, you under I, I'm against the road because we're, we're about keeping the natural state natural. So how about, how does cutting a road through the government, through the heart of, of five meters, how does that keep it natural? How does that benefit the animals? I, well, I mean, again, I, I, I'm not going to try and make up an answer for you, okay, because I don't have it. We'll, we give, you an, we'll give you an honest, sorry? If we don't have them to hunt, then we don't have anything. No, but, I, you know, look. It's all about. Okay. So Let's uh, let's move on to the next question. Yeah, Charles, you, will you please stick around and talk to us at our Wildlife Management Division table, and, and, and hopefully we can delve a little bit deeper into it there. Uh, appreciate you bringing it up. Yeah, I do too. Next up is Steve Filipek. Thanks a bunch for uh, having this forum. Thanks a bunch for having this forum. I'm representing the Arkansas Wildlife Federation. I'm the Southwest Arkansas Regional Director and appreciate Director Fitz, his staff, the commissioners for doing this. Uh, when I first heard about it, I said, boy, they've got some intestinal fortitude to be doing this. So, <laughs> and, and it's kind of appropriate. I'm, I'm almost to the last here because uh, I'm really just thankful that you're doing this for the anglers, the hunters, the wildlife enthusiasts, and I uh, appreciate it. Somebody really prayed for rain, but it didn't keep everybody from being here. So thanks a lot. Thank you for your comments, Steve. Uh, we've got, looks like, uh, three more questions, and we may get these in. Uh, Ken Besser from Little Rock. Ken? Uh, uh, thank you. I'll probably be touching on something that the Cochran's have discussed. But I haven't been biometer for about 17 years, and we've lost a tremendous amount of habitat due to the cutting of the brush. And... In losing that habitat, I spend as much time deer hunting probably as I do duck hunting. So last year, y'all addressed tree management tremendously. My question is, if you're not able to get somebody to go in and cut the trees because the trees are topi or not, not good and they're no value in your 1% or however much percentage you're, you're, you're cutting, I know hurricane's been cut, Dagmar's been cut, the canopy and, and, and the area and biometer we're losing tremendous amount of uh, thicket areas and where ducks and deer and all of that that's our resources i don't care y'all can say trees are your resources i believe game is your resource because that's what's bringing the people in the money so does your budget allow you to 
put a contract in to cut the areas that are of no value for the trees. I was, is my understanding, you had three contracts that were let and there wasn't a, a lumber or a timber management company that would come in and cut because the trees were so bad. I just thought I'd see if you could address that. Brad, you want to hit that one real quick? And I, I think this is going to be a discussion that's probably going to be better talked about out there, but take a stab at it. Yeah, the short answer is is yes, we routinely in, in our habitat program budget uh, include treatments such as uh, herbicide injection to remove uh, things that aren't merchantable. Uh, the, the work that you mentioned about uh, losing habitat with the thickets, we did extensive uh, mulching to try to restore the drainages so that we could get the water off. That was mentioned <laughs> earlier. So it was intended to improve drainage to help manage the area sustainably long term, but we do have funding to do work in areas that aren't uh, commercially viable to, to have a timber sale. All right, and Lance Oaks from Searcy. Lance? Uh, yes, I duck hunt up in White County on a hurricane. And the tree cutting, that was something that just got brought up that really kind of hits home. Uh, I would say the cutting there has been more of a clear cut. And whenever they do that, like the trash that's left, you talked about a controlled burn. Is that a possibility on the WMAs? And one more question, just real quick. Could we ever revisit the spin and wing ban? Let's do a statewide, either yes or no. Um. A burn to push up all the the brush piles left over after clear cut. Is that what you're? Well, they they came in in the late 90s or mid 90s. Yeah. And they did several clear cuts. There right. Was like four or five acres. I mean, I don't call a clear cut. Where, where specifically? In Hurricane. In Hurricane. Okay. Yes, sir. And they said it was for a region. <clears throat> okay. Uh, well, I mean, we've got timber experts on the commission. I you know I think any of us that. They work on timber. I mean, you know, there's there's a lot of trade-offs when you start talking about impact on invertebrates. Not, okay. Well, I, I can tell you several of these guys were on Hurricane in uh, October because I was there with them. So you've been on the north end where almost every tree is colored to be cut. I, 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 again, I think that if we're going to have a discussion about timber management, it's clearly not something we're going to answer in, in, in two or three minutes with some sound bites. So I'm... I invite you to stick around and, and uh, we'll engage in that discussion at the wildlife management table out in the, in the lobby. Trey, uh, I just want to add or, or quickly point please. out, I'd love to visit with you too, uh, along with, with Brad and the wildlife management team, but the main thing that you need to understand is that these forests get a certain age and they've got to be regenerated. Yeah, They're going to get old. Absolutely. So. And so, you know, the management does a good job of addressing each part of our WMAs. They're going right now through a forest health assessment process. It's, it's over about a five-year period looking at each WMA, uh, looking at the different stand units, and, uh, and addressing those old stands and, and getting them regenerated. So you're going to see more of that in the future. It's got to be done. It's just gonna look. It's just gonna look ugly. You know, uh, that's the way a, a a regen cut looks. It's just gonna look like a bomb went off. Well, a lot of that timber. But give it give it twenty years, thirty years, and it's you're gonna see young stuff coming on, and future generations will benefit. One other quick point, and, and again, back to Mr. Cochran's, uh, I didn't get to speak to that just real quick, but diversity is key to good habitat management, it, whether it's on for deer, turkey, ducks, but ground disturbance, getting, getting grasses and forbs in there, or in invertebrates, as Bobby mentioned, is good for wildlife. If we had all closed canopy 
hardwoods, we would not have a good habitat. All right, this is the last question we've got, and it was uh, uh, submitted in writing by, uh, by someone. Uh, what is the purpose of extending a 14-inch size limit on trout below Norfolk when we have more 14-inch trout and it's hard to catch a legal limit? And there's a secondary question, why don't law enforcement officers check private boats for this limit at the ramps? This is Christy Graham, our trout program coordinator, who came down from Mountain Home for tonight's meeting. Yeah, we, uh, we put that regulation into effect the beginning of last year. It was uh, one of the things that we did when we went through our public meetings and management plan workshops was the need and the desire from the public that came to our <coughs> meetings and did surveys that they wanted to see more big fish and the opportunity to catch more big fish. Um, and so that was the reasoning for us putting that in. It was a lot of public input. Our population surveys showed that we don't have very many trout over 14 inches, so uh, it was just our way of trying to provide that opportunity for folks. And Ma Major Tucker or Major Young want to hit the second part of that? I'll take the second half of that question. Uh, as far as uh, our enforcement personnel, uh, I'm sure, I'm very very confident that they are working the ramps and working the public access areas and enforcing the regulations as they pertain to trout. Uh, most of our guys up in, guys and gals up in that region do a very, very good job of, of, uh, of enforcing these regulations. Okay, uh, we, we said we'd go to 715. Now, did anybody come in after the sign up? I think I got, we've got one, we're probably not going to get to all of you. I saw your hand up first. You want to ask a question real quick? Wait till you get a microphone. My name's Ward Gardner. I'm from Little Rock, Arkansas. Here's my question. How does a $20 million nature center in Northwest Arkansas improve hunting and fishing in Arkansas? How does it make more money? How does it keep you out of trouble with the legislature? I don't, I don't get that. It's a fourth of the budget. And when Ben needs money and the turkey guys need money, that's a big chunk of change. And that's the 10th nature center in Arkansas. Texas, Texas Parks and Wildlife has zero. Well, first of all, Northwest Arkansas is the largest. My wife's from Bentonville. What now? My wife's from Bentonville. I know Northwest Arkansas. Okay. It's growing like crazy. Been growing like crazy. We have no presence there. We had one regional office up in Be on Beaver Lake that is dilapidated and falling through the ground. It's time we make a stand, and we it is our number one project that we're going to do right there, right now. There's a lot of people, a lot of implants coming in, supporting Walmart, where Bobby used to work, supporting Tyson Foods. We have no representation up there, none. And it's time we go make a contribution to that part of the state in the largest growing area and touch those kids, provide our opportunity to train them, teach them, and educate them on wildlife. We are far beyond the curve by decades. So it is a priority. It is very much a priority. Let me, yeah, let, I, let, me add, let me add to that. Uh, First of all, it's not a $20 million project. It's closer to $15 million, and half of that is coming from our funds. Half is coming from private donations. Mm -hmm. And there's approximately 100,000 school-aged children there that we can reach with this center. And it's, and it's not the 10th. It's the fifth nature center. I think we have four other education centers, but this will be the, fifth, the fifth nature center. Oh, I think I'll take no, issue I, with that on that. I, oh, you, big you get time. those hundred thousand kids in there, and you'll you will increase your license sales. But, but we're not looking at next year. We look at twenty uh, years from now. What, years what from do now. you do in Northwest Arkansas? And I'm not putting you on no, the spot. No, Bob, it, it's fine, Commissioner Martin. My name's Wardgard. I'm a doctor in Little Rock. My wife's from Bentonville. So okay. I've, I've, we've been married twenty years. I've seen it grow. But the thing is, it frustrates me as an angler to see the fisheries department get a cut while we're I, building a big nature center in Northwest Arkansas. Yeah, I don't think that, that I don't think the cut in any of these divisions here is related to the project. But in Commissioner Arkansas. Martin, it's gone down for ten years. The fishing budget. 
Okay. Uh, that 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 we that, I think that, we have a lot more education to do uh, in terms of how Alan brought some of that up. How early. funds. But you know, I I'm gonna I wanna say something here at the end that I wanted to anyway. Uh you know, number one, we after tonight, tomorrow morning or when we gather back up, we're gonna wonder whether we did something good here tonight or not. Okay? And probably those of you that took time to come out, you're gonna do the same thing. I mean, we're after the kind of transparency and the challenge and and so forth that you're pushing back on, as well as the awareness of how we are trying to work on some of these challenges and problems. And I, I would say to you, when, I, when we, and, and I, I, I think I speak for every commissioner, when we look back out at all of you, to us, you are the <coughs> conservationists of Arkansas. And I'm not trying to be funny with that. Okay, and we're losing, we're losing the people behind us, seriously, and it's a big deal. In fact, I mean, to us, we think it's a very big deal. So that's why, you know, we're doubling down uh, with our efforts in education. And our return <laughs> expectation is that it should, you know, increase the participation. And maybe it's going to be in viewable wild, wildlife, uh, you know, those type of things more so. Uh, hopefully the anglers are back. We're getting kids back fishing and so forth. If we don't do that, we're going to continue to lose on conservation. We lose that. We're going to lose habitat. We do that. Our, our wildlife is challenged. And, and we all know that. We all know the big picture. But I, I just hope. You know that you know <laughs> that you sense from us what we're trying to do is to increase that transparency and your challenge you know that's just more of accountability so our expectation out of that of those dollars spent and we would not be doing it if it wasn't already right now for the ability to have the kind of private support but you've so, already got none have you got data that shows it's increased license sales i'm sorry nine you've already what? got four nature centers is there data that shows you've increased license sales because of those four no, no, but I, you know, look, I think for us, everybody is awakening, okay? The project, and this is a national issue, okay? When we say R3, it, I don't want that to be a buzzword. I mean, a buzzword. It's for us, it's recruitment. How do we get new? How do we retain people? How do we reactivate those that have lost interest, whether it's because of the quality or the whatever? But we can't give up on it. And, you know, have we always maximized probably the nature centers to do the things we hoped they would do? Maybe not as well as we know we've got to because we all know we're in this battle. So the expectation that you're pushing back and challenging on, I, we accept it, okay? And collectively, I hope that, you know, what, we're, what you're feeling from us is we need the partnership as well because all of us have got to do something to kind of help get this next generation coming along to take the interest and so forth. I, I, I'm afraid that we've kind of gotten off track in terms of the picture of <coughs> Director Pettit's about how Funds are allocated, where federal grants come, how money flows, how budgets are set, and so forth. And maybe at another time or outside, we can kind of help clear that up for you. I saw a couple hands, a lady back here, and then, sir, you'll be next. And I, I think that'll, that'll be it. Good evening. I just want two and a half five minutes for comments and three second questions. My name is Loretta Lever, and I am a certified minority woman on business here in Arkansas, certified by the state of Arkansas. And we provide promotional products, educational promotional products that could help in fishing and hunting and duck, turkey, et cetera, nature centers. And we provide uh, decorated uh, clothing apparels. And I look around and I see all of the, the polo shirts and the jackets and, and the commissioners have some beautiful vests on. And we do those as well. So I'm advocating that that uh, let's keep the money in Arkansas. Let's have economic development here. Let me help create jobs here in Arkansas by, we work with so many state agencies and we have uh, license for five universities. We have 3,300 suppliers. My question is how can I, my business do work with the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission? That's a good question and uh, our director will meet with you afterwards. And the gentleman in the next row there. Uh, thank you. I, I appreciate this, uh, your time here, uh, gentlemen. And uh, I'm probably the only person here. My name is Jack Stewart. I'm not going to tell you where I'm from because lots of turkey on my property. Uh, uh, <laughs> we, 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 do allow, we do allow hunting on our property, although I don't hunt myself, and that's why I'm here. I want to represent the people who can hunt 365 days a year. Uh, if I go out with you hunting, I've got a pair of binoculars. And... Uh, uh, 
I don't think there's a whole lot of conflict there, and I appreciate the commissioner's comment on the diversity of habitat, because that's what we all want. That's what brings in the birds that I'm looking for and look, it is, good, is good for the wildlife. So I really appreciate this time to, uh, to meet with you. Hey, thank you for that. Thank you. Looks like we got one, one more here, and we're going to have to cut it off after this. Thank you very much. I'm from Clark County. I'm a cat fisherman. I'm not a bass fisherman. I see thousands of bass. I don't eat them. I don't catch them. I catch catfish. I made a rule this year about using bait that you caught yourself. And it was for the purpose of crawfish, but the way it's worded, it's so vague, I can't take my grandchildren out, catch a grasshopper, put it on a hook, and throw it in the pond. It's against the law now. Why? I can't use catoffa worms. I can't use red worms that I've caught, night crawlers I've caught, unless I'm purchased them from a store and have the receipt. Sir, the only thing that rule you're talking about, our wild caught bait fish rule, is about wild caught bait fish. It does include crayfish, none of those other invertebrates. You can do catalpa worms, you can do crickets, grasshoppers, any other invertebrate that you can get. It's just bait <laughs> fish and crayfish. Okay, but it's real vague in the book. And our uh, bait no, fish is defined no, no. in our code very it's clearly, clear. and it, it's just bait fish okay. and crayfish. Thank Appreciate you very it. much. Trey, you've well, taken thanks way everybody too long. for coming out, and wait, I'll uh, wait, pass it over to Ford. But yeah, want to encourage let, let, let you. Let me wind up with a couple of comments real quick. I'm I'm just curious about one thing. You 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 asked, would you be willing to revisit the spinning wing decoy? What is your position on the spinning wing decoy? Uh, I personally do not like them. Okay. All right, that's all I need to hear. Hey, uh, Kev, hey, where's enforcement? Young, here, get him. You want spinning wing decors back? Okay. All right. The sur I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you what drove the whole thing. Public input surveys. A hundred percent. That's what drove these decisions that were put in front of us. All right. Thank you. Hey, look. We had. I appreciate everybody coming here, and uh, it means a lot to us, and I hope it does you. But one of the things I want to emphasize: the guys and the gals that work at this game and fish commission. You don't know how dedicated they are. Not only do we feel like that we do everything possible we can to provide you a place to hunt and fish, but there's another part of that that you gotta remember. It's also incumbent on us to do everything possible to make sure that that environment that you're hunting or fishing in, that you have a quality experience. Going hunting's one thing, you take a kid hunting and he comes back and he hadn't seen a duck, he hadn't had a very good time and he probably doesn't want to go back. We want to not only provide the place to hunt, but to make sure through some regulations that you have a quality environment to hunt in and can have every expectation that when you leave that boat ramp, you're going to come back a happy camper after that hunt. And that's the mission of this commission and everybody that works here. Thank you, Joe. All right, we're gonna we're gonna wrap we're gonna wrap it up. Uh, um, I would like for y'all to go on our website and make any comments about whether this was worth the time, worth the effort to uh, to do an environment like this. I will also want to thank everybody for taking the time to come out in this weather, and um, y'all have a good evening. Be safe. <laughs>